and we are at a very interesting point in the history of the MCU. We've talked a lot on the show just about some of the challenges that we face with recent MCU projects, particularly in phase four. Now we are in phase five. And a lot of that has been on the theatrical side. Some of the movies haven't performed to the level that we quite expected them to. But in addition to that, the expansion into television has certainly taken the MCU into a much different direction than how we first experienced it for those first 10 or 11 years or so. But what's interesting about Secret Invasion is that this is the first MCU TV series of phase five, but it's also like the first official one that we've gotten in Almost a year. We haven't gotten an MCU TV series since the end of last summer with She-Hulk. Now, we've gotten a couple of specials such as Werewolf by Night and the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. But there's been quite of a layoff, you know, between series at this point. And we know that Disney, Marvel Studios, they have sort of taken a slow down approach in terms of their rollout. They have certainly pumped the brakes on just the amount of content that we're seeing from them. I think just due to some of the fatigue that audiences are experiencing and also just some of the poor reception that we've just transparently seen across the board with some of these projects. And so I just want to ask you now that Secret Invasion is back and it's been almost a year since we got mm -hmm. She-Hulk Attorney of Law. Have you missed the Marvel TV shows? Has it been good to have a little bit of time off to not really have <laughs> to deal with the week to week sort of back to back episodic releases that we get? And how do you just overall assess where they are with their TV projects in particular right now? Yeah, I I think I definitely enjoy the time off between these Marvel TV shows um, and, and mainly is the the quality piece of it. I think the world, I think, just needed time to, I think, sit on everything we already have, give Marvel time to breathe and to make something worthwhile, I think. And I think that was important, you know, in the, in, in the amount of time, of course as ingesters of all of this content there's a part of me is like ah there's no marvel tv show right now you know what i mean but overall it it, it i think it made sense um to have you know a, a near a year off to uh, for these marvel tv shows and so i've i've been i think in a in a pretty decent place uh when it comes to those and i haven't really missed it too much um i, I really have been i think kind of coasting on all the other things i think we have to worry about um and all the other uh, uh, content that's coming out because I think a another issue with with Marvel and some of these other properties nowadays they don't give you time to miss anything and and I think that's a problem you know you 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 made it you've always made a great point when it comes to Star Wars man when when episode seven was coming out part of the reason I was so hyped for that movie was because we hadn't got Star Wars in so long and the trailer comes out and it's a good trailer. You know what I'm saying? And so it's, it's, it's another, it's the same thing with Marvel though. Marvel hasn't really followed that. Marvel hasn't really followed that. And, and, and I think these next couple releases will make me more excited to ingest that Marvel content. And I think secret invasion is of no, no exception. It has been a long time since we've kind of ingested that there hasn't been too, too, too many Marvel films in the in-between. And so I think we're in a good spot. Um, when it comes to, I think, wanting a little bit more Marvel content in the, on the TV side of things. Man, what a time that was before The Force Awakens came out. That was just, that was magic. <laughs> that was a magical time. But um, yeah, I have to agree. I haven't missed it. And, and, and a part of that is due to the fact that the shows themselves haven't been of the highest quality. You know, we've had a couple mm -hmm. of exceptions to that. I know both of us really enjoy Miss Marvel and Low Key. They have been yeah. particularly successful within this new sort of experiment on streaming and with the television series. But outside of that, a lot of these TV shows have been kind of misfires to, to certain extents. And they've had their, their shining moments. There have been opportunities where I, I would watch an episode and I'm like, oh, that was a great 45 minutes of TV, but can we sustain that, that same mm -hmm. level of interest and excitement over the course of six episodes or eight episodes or however many episodes they were putting out at a particular time. And so to just have some moments and opportunity to breathe and just digest the films that we've gotten theatrically, I think it's been good. It's welcomed. The films have not necessarily hit the high watermark that I would want them to at all particular points in times. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 being the exception to that. But to just like not have to worry about this on a week to week basis has been a good thing. And also what's really funny and I think interesting about this is that for any other franchise or for any other studio or TV property, we have to wait a long time in between seasons. Anyway, we have to wait mm -hmm. two, sometimes three or four years in between seasons. Atlanta had a four year layoff and that felt like yeah. forever and it was forever. But mm -hmm. Marvel obviously being a much different beast and being a shared cinematic universe, you're telling these one off stories and these crossover stories on a consistent 
multi time a year basis. And so I think uh, having that that chance to just sit back and breathe has been a welcome op- opportunity for sure. And what's I think notable and interesting about Secret Invasion within the context of all of this is the fact that it is a much more grounded story when we've been getting a lot more of the cosmic MCU over the past couple of years, which I think has also sort of certainly worn on people in terms of what they're looking for and what they desire out of some of these stories. But let's talk about Secret Invasion specifically as it relates to the comics. Now, in the lead up to the show, we, we've been certainly hype about this series just because of the fact that Secret Invasion in Marvel Comics has a big, big, huge history. You know, when it came out in 2008, I believe it was written by Brian Michael Bendis. It was this huge epic crossover event that essentially touched all corners of the Marvel Universe and comics. Pretty much everybody was involved. Every character, the Illuminati was involved. Tony Stark and Black Bolt and Black Panther, mm-hmm. even world figures were involved in the storyline. You know, you had people like George Bush and Barack Obama that yeah. ended up being pulled into the story. So it was absolutely one of those seminal events in Marvel Comics that changed the trajectory of where the stories were heading at that particular time. And so when we hear that they're doing a secret invasion show, it's like, oh, wait a second. This has to be epic. This has to be big. Now, we know the MCU in particular, they've adapted numerous comic storylines throughout their history, but loose adaptations, I think, is the better way to describe them. They haven't been one for one adaptations. You can look at Civil War or Infinity War and say, like, there are very, very notable changes from what we saw in the comics. Now, what I want to ask you is about the Secret of Asian comic and then just the translation to live action. What do you think makes this story so special? And what do you think is the reason that Marvel decided to pull the trigger on telling somewhat of a loose adaptation of the Secret Invasion story at this particular time right now? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the what makes the original Secret Invasion so good is, you know, at the time. I just imagine. Uh, a world where everything you think you know is no longer real, you know, and I think that's always kind of been a good point of storytelling, especially if you have been living with Marvel Comics for all of this time and you you got used to all of these characters, you got used to all of these storylines and then they're like, OK. Now, what if we told you some of the people, you know, and love are scrolls <laughs> and they're not who you think you are or you they're not who the, uh, you think they are. And so it's it's. It just blows up everything and it makes for really good storytelling. In fact, the 2008 run, what I like about it is the the teams we're faced with, they get hit with it. It's actually the new Avengers. They're like the first people that find out about this thing. Tony, Tony Stark is like, hey, y'all, we just got back from Japan. Electra is a scroll. All hell breaks loose. Everyone's like, what? <laughs> and not only that, but the main problem why they're scared is. They say we have we had no way to detect it. I love that because, of course, all of these big, crazy beings, all of these, all of the technology they have. You telling me there's no way nobody knew Electro was a scroll and who else could be a scroll if it's undetectable? That's some scary stuff. And so uh, it, it's just a cool storyline. It's it's the concept of what if aliens have been here the whole time and you didn't know it? That's a real thing in real life. A lot of people believe that. They could be in the ocean that we have uncharted. They could be walking among, among us and we just don't know. And so that just turns out to be a really good story. And I think that's part of what made it special is that big gallery of, of heroes. and You don't know exactly who they are. It's just a really good story, I think, um, at the end of the day. Coming into the MCU and, and Secret Evasion here, I think what makes this a good time for them is their setup of scrolls. I think, you know, we 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 know Captain Marvel isn't a perfect movie. Um, I don't I don't think it's terrible either, <laughs> but I think they did do some scroll work, you know, in, in that. And they did do scroll work in, in other properties um in the in the MCU. And but not only that, now we have become accustomed to a ton of characters and storylines, just like the comic. Uh, kind of comics have already done now we have established characters that now we can say in secret invasion in the mcu and it's live action and go wait they've been a scroll this entire time and i think this they they've just done the groundwork they've done over a decade you know amount of work to 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 kind of set us up for the storyline and i think that that's what makes this uh good timing and i think it makes sense it even falls in line kind of what we've been seeing um uh, in the mcu it's like okay now's now it's time to pull the trigger because the the story just makes sense to do so yeah i think um uh, in addition to what you said about the comic run as well and and sort of echoing those sentiments it's that paranoia of wait a second everything that we thought we knew was 
drastically about to change and the very heroes that we root for on a week to week basis when we're following them might actually end up being the opposition because in the comic mm-hmm. book scrolls have typically been portrayed as these warmongering villains and, and we know that in the mcu they have certainly changed how we perceive them mm-hmm. um and, and and i think that that definitely just adds a new layer of oh it's uncertain and it's unclear who the actual hero and or villain is. And so you have to ask all these questions like, oh, well, wait a second. The, that run that I read for, you know, a couple of years now, now you're telling me that, you know, this character has been a scroll for 10 years or 15 years. Mm-hmm. That just changes the whole dynamic. And it creates a really, really interesting sort of conversation that you have just about their place within that story. Coming into the MCU, I think people often forget that. I believe for a while, Disney and Marvel Studios did not even have the rights to the scrolls. I think that they actually were over at Fox for a few years and then they were eventually able to get back those rights. So it took a little bit of time to actually introduce that particular species within the live action films. And we saw with Captain Marvel, that was the first first time that they made a real significant splash. And so now we have this whole new sandbox of stories that we can play with, this whole new mythos and, and, and lineage that we can add to, to the stories that we're going to be telling for the future. And so Captain Marvel, while it's not a great film, definitely a nice soft introduction to just that idea. And what mm-hmm. really threw people off, I think, just, you know, as avid reader of comic books, you come into that movie and you see like, well, wait a second, these scrolls are sympathetic now. A lot of them are just refugees without a home. They're not necessarily villains looking to conquer different species or different universes. They're not necessarily at war with the Kree because they mm-hmm. just want to dominate them. They're at war out of survival and and, and out of the, the the sense of desperation in, in, in that sense. And so they add a whole new element and layer to how you can just, you know, tell them across these different stories. And I think it... I think it is interesting. You know, I don't know if everything necessarily works in terms of making them sympathetic, but I do find that it's interesting and it certainly subverts your expectations in in a good way, because for so long now we're presented with these villainous factions. Hydra has been kind of the main one for the longest. Mm -hmm. And so when you introduce another one, it's like, well, how are we going to make them different? Well, in actuality, there will be some bad apples. Don't get me wrong. But many of them are just like normal. They just want to find a home and have their normal relationships with their counterparts, with their families, things of that nature. So I do find just the whole formula of how they've been brought over into live action really interesting. That brings us to Samuel L. Jackson, who has been portraying Nick Fury for pretty much the beginning of the MCU. He was, in fact, mm-hmm. in Iron Man 1 back in 2008 and appeared in that post credit scene, which really just kickstarted everything and approached Tony Stark wanting to talk about the Avenger initiative. And from there, I think Samuel L. Jackson has pretty much been in more MCU projects and has made more appearances than any other character. He's just been a mainstay for all of this time. And there's many, many funny stories about Samuel L. Jackson and his involvement in the MCU and how that came to be. Just the the whole likeness issue with him being in the ultimate version of the Avengers and basically parlaying that into a deal, like a nine picture deal. But he's still here. He's still sticking around. But this is the first time that we're seeing him actually lead a project all the way up until this point in particular time. He's been supporting. He's been the guy behind the scenes, pulling the strings, bringing the Avengers together. But he's never had a lead project within the MCU. And we know Samuel L. Jackson is much more than capable to lead his own project. He's done oh, yeah. dozens and dozens of movies and, 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 and things of that nature where he's led. But how do you feel about this kind of being the first opportunity to really dive into Nick Fury? We've gotten parcels of information, small pieces and bits over the course of you know his appearances and projects. But now he's front and center. This is his show. This is built and based off of him. So how do you feel about the fact that it pretty much took like 16, 15, 16 years to actually get to this point to where we could tell a solo Nick Fury story. Yeah, I, I love the idea first and foremost because it's freaking Samuel L. Jackson. You know what I'm saying? Like this is a a legend. Um, and we there, it's not very often, you know, nowadays that we get to see him just lead a project like at all, you know, for the most part. And so at least especially from the TV show side. It's not like Samuel Jackson's out here on TV every week. You know what I'm saying? So it it feels good to see, I think, to, or at least to get the opportunity, I think, to see him uh, uh, just do what he does best and see where he can take the MCU, especially as a character, Nick Fury, and what he does is already, uh, he already has, a, I think, a more mature sense, you know, of who he is. He doesn't have any powers. So he always kind of felt like a, of course, he created the Avengers, but he's always felt like the big brother to the Avengers, you know, and I think that that can that can feel uh, the same way by this TV show as well, where this TV show also feels like the big brother a little bit, where this TV show can also feel like 
it's a little bit more mature than uh, other Avengers content is. And so I, I I really like it, man. I really like even the I really like the promo art too, or the the poster where you could clearly see his face is scratched. I like to me that that's the concept is like let's take the eye patch off. We're done with the childishness. You know what I'm saying? I I love that idea because that's what it feels like. Um, they were trying to do here with Secret Invasion in, in in Samuel L. Jackson, man. But I couldn't, I really couldn't be more happy to for them to finally give him a chance um, to do this. Like you said, he's been here the whole time, but he's never been defocused. He may have been a component. He may have been, you know, uh, important in some of these other stories. Of, of of course, mainly the Avengers. And but it's 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 his time, and I I like uh, I like the energy surrounding him. It feels good. Yeah, I think when we look back on all of this, it'll be great to say, like, yes, Nick Fury, Samuel Jackson, they finally got their own project. You know, his his biggest involvement, I think, in particular within the MCU have been the first Avengers movie, Captain America, the Winter Soldier, and then mm -hmm. Captain Marvel. Those have kind of been his meatiest roles up until this point, but he was always sort of playing the second to to, to somebody in the lead mm -hmm. position. And so now yeah. coming into it, just being the pure focal point and, and a lot of the story really revolving around him and his entire history up until this point as a character it's it's a really profound thing to see because you want to utilize Samuel Jackson. He's gone on many interviews over the years and he's like, well, why the hell didn't I show up in Wakanda? You think Nick Fury would be in Wakanda? <laughs> and it's like, all right, well, you know, Sam, you can't be in everything, but I get what you're saying. Like, let's get you yeah. more opportunity and time to shine. And so it's just great to now have that moment and, and, and the time that we can spend, even though it's only going to be six episodes, just a chance to dive deeper into him. And I think within these first two episodes, we're already starting to see a lot mm -hmm. of those layers peel back about his character and the things that we thought we knew that might've been a little bit different. And, and some of the things that are just adding additional layers and elements to who he is and in, in, in that depth and dimension um, to, to really inform some of the choices that he's made over the years is starting to make a lot more sense. And I think that that just provides a richer contextual backdrop to who he is as a character. And that's what these TV shows are supposed to do. They don't always succeed at that, but if they actually set out to do that from the get go, we can see how that actually, you know, sort of starts to reap the benefits of, of just having more time, more hours to really just flesh out that character and that story. But with all of that out the way, let's go ahead and dive into it and actually start to talk about this in detail and officially get into our review of Marvel Studios' original series, Secret Invasion. The Great Nick Fury. Now, this series is created by Kyle Bradstreet, and all episodes are directed by Ali Salim, and it's starring Samuel L. Jackson, Ben Mendelsohn, Kingsley Benadir, Killian Scott, Samuel Adewunmi, Dermot Moroni, Richard Dormer, Amelia Clark, Olivia Coleman, Don Cheadle, Charlene Woodard, Christopher McDonald, and Katie Finneran. So Ooh. before we dive into spoilers, because we're going to do spoilers for both episode one and episode two as a catch up, just want to start with your big picture snapshot of how you feel about Secret Invasion up until this point. What do you think about episode one? What do you think about episode two? And we'll dive into the conversation in a second here and talk about all the details. But just with all of that backdrop, all of that contextual information out of the way, I will pass it over to you. What do you think so far about Secret Invasion? I like it. I like it. I don't love it yet, but I like it. It's it's. The MCU, I think, has been uh, stuck in a... I think fantastical loop for so long because it had to be, you know, this is superhero content. It is what it is that now um, it feels like we're able to, to come back literally to the ground. <laughs> That's Nick Fury. He's literally coming back to the ground to handle some crazy business um, with these scrolls, man. And I like that. I like the, you know, we've been we've we've talked so much um, about the MCU and how jokey it can be and how silly some things are. And this show doesn't have really any of that in it. It's it it is almost serious all the time, like in in especially again, coming off something like She-Hulk, where you're poster or at least made to laugh multiple times an episode. It is a good change in pace to say man this is just a tv show that happens to be marvel <laughs> and that in 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 and they give us you know story elements 
the one thing that's kind of detracting me from this is there are glimpses of but perhaps too many references to the Avengers and other MCU things that scared me a little bit that could that could potentially push it back into a realm of ooh I don't know about this TV show there are glimpses but it has not fallen all the way into those things for me yet it has yet to to for me to roll my eyes and be like up oh, we're bringing up Iron Man again up oh, we're bringing up this again it hasn't done that too much yet and so as of right now i'm fine i it feels good the action was is crazy than i thought it was going to be there's some bloody stuff <laughs> going on and some it's some torture and it. it's, it's it's some it's a lot of cool stuff i think coming out of this and i think you know it it yeah i don't know it just feels good to be i think in a different place in landscape in a a marvel a marvel series by the way of which we're telling these stories and this definitely it does feel more mature and it does feel a little more grounded it is the spy espionage that i thought it was going to be uh the the other comment i will make though is it it is a little weird as we were just talking about the original secret invasion that as of right now the first two episodes this does seem far removed from the hero stuff this does seem far removed from that. There's not a lot of heroes. We're not finding out Electra is a scroll. You know what I'm saying? Which was part of, I think, the 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 pizzazz and part of the what made your eyes bright when you when you read the original Secret Invasion 2008. It was like, oh, all these heroes are involved. This doesn't feel like that. In fact, there is a little tagline where uh where where Nick Fury is like this is my war, <laughs> you know, kind of type thing. And and as he says that, I'm like, you're right. This doesn't feel like anybody else is involved in terms of like other Avengers and any in in, in things like that so I I don't know how I feel about that piece yet because that is like a big part of the source material and I don't know where that's going I think it's going to take the rest of the episodes for me to be like okay I like that decision not to include that or I do um but yeah I uh but so far man I don't have so many qualms uh I just need more story and it and I will say already too it's like dang six episodes why did we make this decision? Because it already feels like four left, you know, at the end of, at the end of episode two, I'm like, there's only four episodes left. And part of that is, yeah, I want to see more, but the other part of it too is it just feel more complete eight to 10, you know what I'm saying? Eight to 10. I just know it feel more complete. Even with these longer episodes, it will feel more complete. So again, it's fine. Uh, I like a lot of things right now, but it's, it's one of the ones I, I, even though I like it, I have to side eye it as I'm watching it. Like, okay, well, I need you to stay on this path. But if they stay, if they keep doing what they're doing and they can give me some surprises in these next uh, couple episodes, then I'd say it's a pretty solid show, man. But we'll have to see. Certainly. So coming into this, as we already sort of noted, high expectations, very much excited and enthusiastic about it. There was a nice amount of time in between shows to just take a break and get get excited and and reacquaint ourselves with the MCU. And then also we were starting to hear reports that internally Disney Marvel were referring to Secret Invasion as their version of Andor, you know, which is the Star Wars series Mm -hmm. that came out last year. I think one of the best series of 2022 by far. It was just exceptional. But I think as a note, and what's really important that uh, maybe these companies, creators, executives should probably stop doing is getting people's expectations up to that level. I think we should mm-hmm. probably just stop with the comparisons. We should stop saying that this Don't is our and or we should stop <laughs> saying that The Flash is probably the greatest superhero movie ever made. Stop maybe it. we should just get rid of that altogether, because mm-hmm. when you start to say stuff like that, you are very much allowing yourself and opening up yourself to just not deliver on those expectations. Now, what I will say so far, is it Andor? Andor? No, it's not, because Andor had a much bigger canvas, a lot more episodes, and they also gave us the first three episodes, which I think was a really smart decision. But Mm -hmm. beyond that, the first episode for me for Secret Invasion, I very much left it thinking like, well, okay, I guess that was fine. It was okay. I didn't hate it, but I was certainly Mm -hmm. thinking to myself that this was an incredibly slow start. And I'm eager and curious to see where the show will go, because right now I'm not feeling I'm not feeling the momentum. I'm not feeling really the the kinetic energy and the paranoia and that 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 that, you know, sort of vibe and aesthetic of of a spy espionage story that I was hoping to see. Mm -hmm. Episode two, I think, is a huge step up from episode one. I liked episode two a lot more. There were some incredible, incredible character moments. There were some great pieces of dialogue and conversations between characters and also some stuff that filled in previous contextual information that we did not know. Because what 
felt like a disconnect for me in episode one was that we were starting to meet characters and we were to assume a lot of information without actually having the facts. They were mm -hmm. bringing up scenarios and situations that we were not yet privy to that we just had to just sort of go with. And I think that that was probably a mistake. You know, maybe having the first two episodes at the same time could have helped with just a general reaction because we were meeting people and it's like, oh, yeah, this happened to so and so. And this is how Nick Fury knows this person. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, wait, how did we get here? And then in addition to that, we're often left to rely on our previous knowledge of a movie like Captain Marvel, which I'll be the first to admit. I don't revisit that often. I'm not watching yeah. Captain Marvel for fun. Like, I'm just not mm -hmm. going to do that because it's not a great movie. And so mm -hmm. if you're coming into this either cold or not with a, a, a good refresher of what came before it, most notably Captain Marvel being the direct tie into this, then you're kind of just like left out there to fend for yourself and just really pick up the pieces for who's who and why does this make sense? And why is this character here? Why is Agent Ross involved in this at all? He was just in mm -hmm. what kind of forever. And so I think that, that that disconnect with episode one was very apparent, but two started to rectify a lot of that for me. And I think that episode two was a much stronger outing and has me really, really excited because there's some deep stuff that happens in episode two, which if they can keep the keep up the momentum for the remainder of the series, I think we'll end off with something that's really, really strong and compelling. I do agree that six episodes still feels too short and I would like to see more, but I think it all depends on the canvas that they use for the remainder of the series because we are getting traditional hour long episodes, 55 minute episodes, as opposed yeah. to that 36 minute bullshit that we used to get from them like a year mm -hmm. ago. It's like, no, use all the runway that you have because that's going to ultimately serve you better in the future. So those are all of our general big picture thoughts about the first two episodes of Secret Invasion. Let's go ahead and dive into spoilers. So if you've not seen episodes one or two of Secret Invasion, this is your official spoiler warning. Go duck out, watch those episodes and come back to finish out the rest of our conversation. And we should just start with episode one in particular, which is entitled Resurrection, that introduces us to the series, the story, and what's going to actually happen here. And I first want to actually talk about Nick Fury, similar to, similarly to what we were doing earlier, because where we find Nick Fury here is at a, it, it's at a much different place than I think we're used to seeing him. He's been away from Earth for years at this point. The last time that we actively saw Nick Fury I believe in terms of like the modern day storyline and the timeline and where we are, I believe it was Spider-Man far from home. I think because we saw him at the end in the, 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 the outer space space station, which is now called mm -hmm. Saber. And I think all of us were just wondering like, well, what the hell, how did he get up here? Because we saw that for that entire movie, Talos played by Ben Mendelsohn was essentially <laughs> impersonating him. Yeah. That was a crazy Easter egg and, and post credit scene in Spider-Man Far From Home. We saw that Nick Fury was off world doing something, but we didn't necessarily know what. And in that time, he's just been away ever since he came back from the blip. He has just not had a presence on earth. And when he finally does return to earth in this episode, everybody's throwing it in his face. Everybody's like, yo, yeah, where the hell you been? Like, now you show up when shit is like mm -hmm. at its worst. Like, you should have been here. We couldn't contact you. We didn't have any means of communication. Maria Hill is obviously upset about it because that's her yeah. right-hand person. They have worked so mm -hmm. closely together for all these years. And so everybody sort of makes it known that, Nick, this really isn't your war. This isn't your fight because you haven't been here when it's actually been the most crucial. You've been off world. And yes, you were doing something serviceable. You were creating the space station to protect us from these extraterrestrial threats in Saber. But at the same time, you also didn't reach out. You also didn't make yourself available for communication just in case we might have needed you. What did you think about just that 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 gap feeling that they sort of did here? Because the last time we saw him in Far From Home, he got his shoes off. He's kicking back. He's chilling in space. And it's like, yo, Nick. You're supposed to be the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., even though S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't exist anymore. Why aren't you protecting Earth? What did you think about just that that, that introduction to the story? Yeah, I love when we see him at the end of Far From Home, because I remember my initial reaction was like, oh, he must be doing something important, you know. But even though, like, this the, the way they set the canvas there was like, my man, it's like the first time we ever seen Samuel Jackson's feet, I'm pretty sure. But, like, he ain't got no <laughs> shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> he's walking through the, the space station. I was like, he must be doing something important up there. But I love how when he when he comes back to Earth here, literally, I, it, it's such a good metaphor. When he literally comes back down to Earth here, everyone is like, what? <laughs> you weren't you weren't with us shooting in the gym all this time. Why are you here? Like, what are you doing? And not only that. But they, you know, not only are they mad that he's been gone, but they are constantly talking to him like, you're also not prepared for what's about to go down. Mm -hmm. You, we just kidnapped you, bro. Easy peasy. That's, 
you're not ready. And everybody is telling them that. Sonia told him that. Maria told him. Everybody is like, Nick Fury, you're not ready because you have not been here shooting with us in the gym. You have your boots have not been to the ground. You have lost every you have lost the you have lost the mojo. <laughs> you are not the Nick Fury that we once knew. And and what's also interesting though, and they're kind of like, we kind of understand, like, because the blip happened, like you we, we kind of get it, but that does not give you an just go home. <laughs> like, don't be here because you're not ready and you're in danger. And so I really like that aspect of it. I really like the his friends and the people around him not being forgiving because that's real. You, they feel like Nick Fury, who's supposed to be, again, who I'm who I'm calling right now, the big brother of all these people, Maria Hill's big brother. Shoot, it seemed like him and Sonya had a good relationship. You weren't around. And now, and so they feel abandoned and they 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 are allowed to feel some type of way. And I like how they don't sugarcoat that at all. Um, they, they just try to hold Nick, Nick Fury uh, accountable for that because up until this point there were a lot of moments where Nick Fury felt I think untouchable you know he felt like everybody just respected him for this and that of course we've seen like a couple missteps the way of Winter Soldier went you know what I mean we've seen a couple things go a little weird but overall Nick Fury was the man and now all of this has happened everyone is telling him he's not the man anymore so yeah I, I just really like the way they set up that canvas of Nick Fury, you used to be the man, you're not anymore. And now this is the show. What is what is Nick what is Nick Fury now? And I love how that's kind of like the the invisible tagline for the TV show. He's in an incredibly vulnerable state at this point and I always love when they can just make those connections to such a universe shattering event like the blip because obviously that affects everybody you know a part of this this tapestry of storytelling and in particular nick fury is the guy who has always been prepared who's always had a plan who's always thinking 10 15 20 years into to the future he could not prepare for thanos his only last resort that he had which is kind of lucky and convenient is the beeper to captain marvel which who has a beeper in 2018 he had a beeper somehow because it was in the 90s that they established a relationship but he didn't have a plan for thanos wiping out half of the universe and so mm. for him to retreat and actually go to space and spend years i think presumably at this point spend at least what three or four years in space i think yeah. makes a lot of sense with this character because even in the first avengers we saw how fearful he was of the looming threat of an alien invasion of an extraterrestrial mm -hmm. threat and he had to form the avengers and he used some pretty deceitful tactics in order to get them together which i want to bring back up later but now with thanos doing such something that was just so just such a catastrophe across the world. And Nick Fury doesn't have the tools to be able to combat that. He goes to space to build this massive, probably multi billions and billions and billions of dollars space station to try to do something to combat any, any looming threat that might be out there, but it's still probably for nothing because the actual threat that's going to be most personal to him is on earth where he should have been the entire time. It's mm -hmm. much more personal to him. It's not just this random alien with a, with a fucking scrotum chin that's out for him. It's actually these <laughs> scrolls that have a connection to him that want to get yeah. back at him because of just this, this previous history they have. And I also do love the fact that we get to see Nick Fury now just age and become older and mm. vulnerable and withered. Like he's not, who he used to be. He has a bad knee. And as you mentioned earlier, we see the scar on his eye. We don't see the eye patch. Like the guy is very much sort of backpedaling on his back foot. He's in the final stretch really of who he's going to be as a hero within this universe, because everything that he's experienced for this, for this entire time and his history within the MCU, it's taken a toll on him, a very, very significant toll. And it's obviously wearing on him. And, and maybe a part of that is him just wanting to present himself as weak because he wants to trick people like Sonya. Perhaps mm. he's perhaps he's allowing himself to be that way so that he mm -hmm. can actually be two steps ahead of her. Or in reality, it's just probably the fact that, yeah, man, you don't have it anymore. You're not the same mm -hmm. Nick Fury. You're not as sharp as you once used to be. And so I just love that they continue to play with that. And we still don't 100% know exactly where Nick Fury is coming from because he's never going to reveal yeah. his full hand. And that's what makes him such a good character. Um, I, I do want to sort of back back a little bit and just like talk about the opening of this episode where we see Everett K. Ross coming back, played by Martin Freeman. The last time we saw him was in Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. And this opening sort of provides a bit of contextual information in terms of why we're here. We first learned that essentially the scrolls are frustrated with Nick Fury because he made a promise to them to find them a new home, which We'll get more into when we talk about episode two and just like the exact specifics of that. But they sort of introduce mm -hmm. that idea here. And then we see this big, massive chase across Moscow, which much of the series takes place. And then by the end of the chase, we see 
Everett Ross fall off a building and it turns out he's a scroll, but it's essentially a scroll in disguise masking masking himself as Everett Ross is not necessarily the same Everett Ross that we've been accustomed to for all these years. But did that throw you off when you first saw it? Like, did you think for a second, like, wait a second, like he has been a scroll this entire time? Because that is a part of the series that people that we've had these relationships with that we've watched from movies and TV series, you never mm. necessarily know who's really a scroll. And so they're already starting to play with that idea of like, whether or not a person actually is who they portray themselves to be or not. I would definitely mess with me. I was like, wait a second, this could be true. Especially again, there has been times uh, we record the podcast and we'd be like, is this guy a scroll? <laughs> is this dude a scroll? What's going on here? And so I, Ross is no exception to that, you know. Uh, what's funny is they could pull a double doozy, and Ross could still be a scroll for all we know. You know what I'm saying? But I, I really do like them playing with this. I, I, it's, it's still a good point. I think that this first episode doesn't really 100 percent get us into the the mode of being as paranoid. I feel like as we should be when it comes to these scrolls. But there was still something there with 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 Ross. They were kind of hitting that or teasing that, like, "Ha, gotcha." But it, you could feel this paranoia, you know what I mean? Like you, you probably should feel this paranoia, even though we we technically didn't. So I really do like that decision, and I hope you know they, you know, we'll see them finding other ways to kind of play with that idea. But I do, it definitely got me for a second because it just makes sense. And now every almost anybody could do it and make sense. And I think, I think whoever is revealed won't necessarily be less surprising if that makes sense but i do think uh uh having an idea in the back of our minds makes it uh something worthwhile to think about yeah i was watching this and i was very confused for those first few minutes i was like wait a second let me go back and rewind because unfortunately i do think that in that chase sequence and you see like ross running and him falling off the building like it was ridiculously dark i don't know why they shot it that way because it, it was. wasn't as clear mm -hmm. as it needed to be and we've brought up this point with several of the marvel tv series just like how they're presented and how they're shot like just make it brighter, y'all. Like, let's just please allow us to see what's actually happening on screen because I had to really just like question myself, like, wait, is it Ross or is it not Ross? Is somebody mm -hmm. just disguising as him? And so that's also just a, a really cool trick that you can play with. I think the the danger, which, you know, this this show has to really walk this line in a very, very fine way is how do you introduce that idea and that concept and not allow it to undermine the story that you're mm -hmm. telling? Because at any point, mm -hmm. Anybody can be anybody, right? We can always employ this trick whenever it's useful, whenever it's convenient. And for a second there, I'm like, oh, shit, did Ross just die in the first like three minutes of the right, show? Exactly. And then he doesn't, right? You know, and so I think that that sometimes can be a good tool to use, but also at other times it's like, well, what am I to really believe anyway? Because even by the end of this episode with Maria Hill's death, like it seems definitive, but we often have to still ask ourselves like, well, she still technically could be alive. Like we don't 1000% know if she's dead or not. And exactly. so I think mm -hmm. it's definitely a trick that they have to be careful with. I do want to move on to some of the new characters that are introduced here. I know we were both very excited about the show just because of the massive amount of talent wrapped oh up God. into the show. It's ridiculous <laughs> who they got yeah. to be a part of this. Kingsley Benadir is the villain. Amelia Clark coming over for Game of Thrones, which she might be the only person now in history who's been in Game of Thrones, Star Wars, and now the MCU. I think she Crazy. might be the only one to perfect that trifecta. And then, of course, Olivia Coleman, likely the best working actress in the world, Academy Award winner, coming in to do a Marvel TV series. Uh, we'll talk more about their specific stories because we learned a lot more about them in episode two. I just want to get your thoughts just about them being here. The fact that they wanted to come play in the sandbox, <laughs> like this incredible talent, not to mention other people, you know, who are part of this show, Dermot Moroni and Shailene Woodard. Like this mm -hmm. is a really, really impressive cast coming in to take on this very grounded, this very mature story within the context of the MCU, which we know is typical to be much more fantastical with other more cosmic stories. What do you think about this? Just really incredible talent being a part of the show man uh it's crazy that they that they really pick these people up man I but I think it makes sense I think they're I think they're doing this because they said let's get some of the best actors for you not to know who they are like who else would be so good at playing these people that you don't know if they're scrolls or not and if you do find out they're a scroll like uh like you said we got Kingsley Benadir here going crazy by the way if 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 you if you you know if you have a, somebody like him they can give you that that i think that emotional tool that you need they can give you that that extra umph in 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 a story where everything is about character and in questioning character and so who are the best actors to do that who who can bring that out and i think they're making tremendous choices here man even Amelia Clark being here, she's talked about her um her her experience on set versus like Game of Thrones. She's like 
She's here like, this is some of the greatest experience I've ever gotten. She said, I love being on this set compared to Game of Thrones where I understand they was they was over there making her be naked like eight hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous over there. But I, I also love how they're taking care of these actors, too, at the same time over on the Marvel side. Again, at least from Amelia Clark's point of view, I really like that. It, it feels good hearing that as a fan that they're taking care of their actors, man. And it's just it's just really cool, man, because man, Olivia Coleman in an MCU show that like. That is not even a concept to me. I'm like, what are we even talking about? Are you sure that Olivia Coleman is here in the MCU show? Um, but man, this cast is is insane. We still have got people to see, <laughs> and I can't wait to see them, man. Because I, I just know that again, all these these big actors with these amazing chops are going to have just big big implications and big uh, giving us really good energy coming into this show, man. And, and it's already been great. Look, again, so far, any of the qualms I have with the show is not on the acting. <laughs> I tell you that it is not on the acting because they are really doing a good job. So I'm pretty excited to have them here. And and by and large, they're using them properly because I think we've seen all the talent in Hollywood eventually sign up to be a part of the MCU. Like mm -hmm. most actors have had some sort of role just because of the amount of projects and the amount of actors that they have to cast but i've often been let down and disappointed by this incredible talent coming in and just being underutilized you know i think we've seen recent examples like michaela cole in black panther wakanda forever it's like yo it's michaela cole she's what incredible use her <laughs> really really actually like utilize and lean on her talents you know that's just one example can't think of any others right now but to see an olivia mm. coleman get used in a very very intriguing and proper way here actually utilizing her chops and just the talent that she has as an actress it's sad Satisfying. Amelia Clark, seeing her have a, a pretty weighty role here, it's really good mm -hmm. to see Kingsley Benadir, who I think still has a long trajectory ahead of him and has only done a few things up until this point. We're seeing what he's capable of. Right. And so I think that mm -hmm. that's equally as important to not only casting them, but also making sure that like, OK, we're going to use these people and we're going to use them to their fullest capabilities. And so it's a really, really cool thing to see just them come in and just have fun and play with this this different story. Um, I, I do want to move on to really the end of this episode, because I think a lot of the conversation we'll have today is about episode two. <laughs> as it informs a lot of episode one. But by the end of episode one, we essentially learned that these scroll rebels, which are led by Gravik, played by King Kingsley Benadir, who's going to be the, the big bad of the show, they essentially are going to commit a terrorist act in 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 in, in Unity Day um, within Moscow. They plan to attack this, uh, this celebration and riddle it with bombs and essentially kill a lot of people. And Fury, Maria Hill, they all find out about this plan. They try to intercept the bombs and the attack. Uh, they're pretty much unsuccessful. We we learned that they are able to kill 2000 people. A lot of people die this day at this Ooh. unity day of celebration. And most notably, and most concerning for us as an audience is Maria Hill. We see that she ultimately perishes because Gravik disguises himself as fury and shoots her right in the middle of the abdomen. And it eventually kills her. And so we got this big, huge moment of a major character that's been with us for like 10 years, ever since the first Avengers. And we've really known her for her relationship with, Nick Fury within this within this particular canon of storytelling. And now he is the one that is having to console her in her final moments of life. And she's also simultaneously thinking like, wait, did you just kill me? Like, we just mm -hmm. we just had this whole conversation and you're the one that killed me. And he's like trying to reaffirm to her like it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. So it was a really, really impactful and I think emotionally profound moment. But what do you think yeah. about the death? What do you think about her ultimately making her exit from the MCU, at least presumably for now? And do you think it was justified were you actually satisfied by her conclusion to this story because i know there's a lot of maria hill fans out there a lot of diehard loyalists because she's been a ride or die for nick for so long and they pretty much dispatched away with her in the very first episode how do you feel about all that man what a crazy like you said emotional moment because maria hill has also been here <laughs> a very long time um and i think I think as personal, they're, they're trying to make this story very personal to Nick Fury and they are not failing. Like it's, it's as in the position that he's in, you already know he's not attached to that many people. Right. And they're like, okay, how can we write this story to take away as many people from him as possible? And you know, the Talos is already by his side, you know, which is, you know, a, a, a friendship there. But Maria Hill has been his ride or die up until this point. And so it, it's heartbreaking when you get the moment where she's like, it's it was you. You're like, what? No, wait a second. That it hurt. It hurt me. I was like, no, 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 no. Are we serious? 
is this really ha like is this the way she's gonna she's gonna die thinking that it it was it was Nick Fury that killed her? That is the saddest way for that really to go down. So I actually think that was really well done because of the emotional pull there. And you know, it it in a in a story as big as Secret Invasion, unfortunately, some people are gonna die. And I think we episode one. It's not perfect, but what I think it does do a good job of doing is setting the stakes. 2000, when I seen that bomb go, I was like, my goodness, is this what we're doing? Like people, we're getting bodies, episode one. And not only that, the the scroll that was impersonating Ross, Maria Hill, and the 2000, it's like, oh yeah, y'all, y'all really, y'all really showing up today. And so uh, even though I am really sad about Maria Hill, in in her tenure leading up to this point again in the back of my mind i'm like some people might have to go <laughs> and it is sad it is unfortunate but it, it i think it will make for a stronger story and i think it will give nick fury some resolve right you can tell it's, it, it it definitely hurt him he he's not the kind of person who as of right now has time to grieve it as much as he can you know what i'm saying we'll see episode two you know and and, and all the things going on there but it's like dang uh, they are setting the stakes high, and I think I think it makes sense for the story they're trying to tell regarding Nick Fury. I think it's necessary for sure. You know, if you want to approach a more mature story and a much more mature take on what you can achieve here, then people do have to die. This has to essentially equate to a war. And we haven't mm -hmm. gotten that type of human toll and human scale in a really long time. As we've already mentioned, we've gotten these huge epic cosmic stories, Guardians of the Galaxy, Quantum Mania, Thor Love and Thunder, like everything has been cosmic, 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 mm -hmm. which is really cool. That definitely ties into much of the comics lineage, all these different alien species and planets and civilizations. But how much are we actually going to care about, you know, a, a dozen aliens dying when, when we know that they're not real? We know that this is like mm -hmm. an extraterrestrial creation. But you can you can then, you know, sort of pivot to secret invasion and take something that feels real, something that feels very much closer to home. We know that there has been terrorist bombings. They, they still happen to this day. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. a crazy thing to know that you can just be out anywhere in the middle of the street, especially in a high profile area, a city like New York or Moscow or London. And you just never know what could happen and you can never know what can really go off. And that's exactly what's happening here. We're actually injecting the story with a lot of emotional stakes that I think are really necessary because Nick Fury as a character is an emotionally grounded mm -hmm. character in the story within the MCU. And very much a lot of that has been taking place on Earth. And then simultaneously, the scrolls and their placement on Earth and their connection to Earth and the human people, we know is much more profound to the story as we see in episode two. So you tie all that together. And I think you have to see that it's going to result in some personal close ties being affected. And Maria Hill, she's put in her time. She's been here for a really long she time. Did. I know a lot of people are definitely upset at the way that she went out in in that episode, which I can I can somewhat get. But at the same time, if you really want to make this something that is personal to Nick Fury, is going to actually get us invested in the story and exactly. really make us em empathize with him. And then also, you know, maybe even the other side to a certain extent, then you have to do things like this. You have to make these really difficult choices, because I'll be honest. Many of the things that we've seen out of Nick Fury so far, especially within the series, don't make him all that much of a sympathetic character. He's right. actually kind of a dick. He's done some very mm -hmm. bad things. And so this is the one element, and it might suck to say, but this is the one element in terms of him losing a person like Maria Hill, somebody that is so close and is so integral and, and, and honest for the most part. I think that that's going to make him all the more richer as a character. Outside of that, it's also sad to see that their last conversation between each other wasn't really a good one. You know, the last mm -hmm. time that they talked, she was kind of telling him like, yeah, you're not who you used to be. And so he has to live with that. And the fact that she might have, you know, had her last moments thinking that it was him who killed her. It, it is really tragic when you put it in that context. But let's transition to, to episode two, because, again, I think so much is revealed here, which really opens up the story and allows us to go deeper into these characters. Episode two is entitled Promises. And we start off with the flashback. We go back to 1997, which is two years after the events of Captain Marvel, which they sort of, you know, quickly recap here. And then we go to 1997 and we see Nick Fury, D.H. Samuel L. Jackson, which, by the way, I got to say, before we get into it, I think in the context of the show, the de-aging is really, really good here. I think it mm -hmm. works a lot. Like you can tell they put a lot of work in and they have nearly perfected it. My problem is, is that we have so much reference material, Samuel L. Jackson, from those particular years. It's like that doesn't really look like him because you can go back and see that 
Samuel L. Jackson at that particular time was a lot more spry. I think the thing mm-hmm. and the problem with de-aging is that they can work on the face for hours and hours and hours, but they can't perfect the body motions body. because mm-hmm. that that that's that's the quick tell because you go back and look at I don't know, uh, mid nineties, long kiss, good night, or, or Jackie mm-hmm. Brown or hard eight. Like you look at those movies, Samuel L. Jackson is like, he's in his forties. He's still feeling young. He's still feeling spry, but here you can tell it's like the 70 year old body of Samuel L. Jackson with like the 40 year old face. <laughs> There's a bit of a disconnect. They, they, it's almost like using the, 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 the skin smoothing effect on zoom to make you look mm, younger. You know, it's, yeah. it's kind of the equivalent of that, but mm-hmm. I do give him props, but that's, you know, a little bit of a tangent. I I, I do want to go back to just like what we're introduced here. We, we find out really the, the central premise and conflict of this whole thing. A young Gravik, he meets Nick Fury back in 1997. And we see Nick Fury give this really impassioned speech about working with the Scrolls and promising to find them a new home because they are displaced. They are refugees. But in exchange for finding them a new home. He wants them to work on behalf of S.H.I.E.L.D. He wants them to go undercover, live on Earth, operate as S.H.I.E.L.D. Mm -hmm. agents, political agents, have normal lives, essentially to give him intel and information about potential threats that might loom in the future. And now we have so much more information about their existence on Earth and how they work directly with him. And Gravik's whole beef is the fact that Nick Fury didn't deliver on the promise that he that he told him as a child. And Gravik has also experienced a traumatic event because his parents essentially were murdered because of the war between the Kree and the skull and so this young kid is angry and he grows up with a grudge and we see that he's now become a monster of nick fury's making so what did you think about just that canvas that they painted out in the relationship between those two and how they made it so personal between gravik and nick fury yeah it's 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 i think it's i i love when the hero creates the villain because it it just gives you more to chew on it gives you more uh uh reason to to say oh man maybe nick fury uh kind of messed up here or maybe he didn't really deliver on his promise because certainly he didn't right uh and to nick to nick fury's side a little bit how the hell nick fury gonna find a world for these people to like the fact that he even made the promise in the first i wouldn't have even <laughs> made that promise bro like i'm just a negro Yo. on earth in 97 and i'm promising some aliens i'm gonna find a new world for the who did he think he was? I don't know who he thought he was. Like for real. Like he was he, leaning on that Captain Marvel bag a little too much there. He thought that he thought she was gonna much. pull through and she couldn't. And she and we know she is such a she's a floater. Captain Marvel a floater. She gonna go wherever she wanna go. <laughs> There's no like it's just crazy that he made that promise in the first place. But it gives some real tension to um uh, to Gravik. It really does because he. Why wouldn't you be angry? Why wouldn't you say we you made us to work for you all of this time and you still haven't delivered on your promise? Not only that, I already I'm already mad. My parents already ain't here. <laughs> I'm already upset. And so I can I can I can see that bubbling, bro. It's not like I have a feeling that the shield I have a feeling that shield did not say, hey, scrolls, here's some therapy. <laughs> I have a feeling they didn't do that. <laughs> and Gravik is a result of that. Gravik Damn. is still processing all of this. He doesn't, his people don't have a home. His parents aren't here. He was already rebellious. You know, them talking about, what's her name? Vara was already talking about the ship and stuff. That He's a smart kid and all that. That energy has to be directed positive, positively. And it clearly wasn't. Um, and so it makes sense how all of this is bubbling after all of this time. It really does. And so I I, I like this. I like I love when the hero creates the villain because it just makes sense. And it makes you it makes you uh, uh, really think about. What what everybody's willing to do, what Gravik is willing to do, what 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 Nick Fury is willing to do, how it's going to go down, because, as you said, Nick Fury is an asshole at some points in time but also when you do make a promise like that and you don't deliver now i can't i can't view you as the hero completely you know what i mean i can't say you were in the right completely now all i can say is graphic is definitely more wrong for killing all those people absolutely that's what i can say i can also say of course nick fury has saved the world and of course he has good intentions but he wasn't right in that moment and i think it it is all it takes is in that moment to create a problem like this, and so I I really love that idea. Yeah, very well said. I mean that it, that that one statement, that one impassioned speech that he gave, created 
a very monstrous problem for him that is taking shape in this current present day storyline. And we have known Nick Fury to be a little manipulative and, 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 and is willing mm-hmm. to say things that aren't 1000% true or backed by actual physical evidence or the ability to pull through and deliver. <laughs> I mean, you go back to Avengers one, my guy used bloody captain America trading cards <laughs> to get the Avengers to assemble. That was pretty much manipula- manipulation on his part. Like he mm-hmm. he employed a tactic to get them together to combat the forces of Thanos and of course Loki at that particular time. Like my guy's a manipulator. He's the ultimate he's the ultimate tactician from that standpoint. And yeah. it, I agree, it's with good intentions, but at what cost? Right? At what cost are you willing to do exactly. something like that? Colson was his right hand man, and he basically told this fabricated lie to get them to rally together to fight Loki. And so we're seeing a very similar situation here where he is just talking so much game and saying so much shit where it's like, dude, you are digging yourself a very, very deep hole right now, which you probably had all the intentions to try to find and, and, and you know, figure out mm-hmm. a solution. But within 30 years, my guy, you have not showed up and delivered like we're coming for the receipt now. Like now we actually have to take it up another level because where have you been this whole time? And then you mm-hmm. bounce, you left. And we know that you left because we have connections and intel to tell us that you were chilling up in space for like four exactly. years. And so now we're pissed. Now, now there's not going to be any more patience. Now we're going to take it to you. And we are willing to sacrifice people, which is that 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 that's what take Gravit, you know, takes Gravit over the line to, to, to more villainous territory because he's willing to kill people in order to prove his mm-hmm. point and ultimately start a war between Russia and the United States to find his new planet on Earth itself. He wants to basically wipe out the human species. And so that makes him much more more monstrous in that respect. Um, moving on here, I want to talk about the next conversation that happens in this episode, and that's between Talos and Nick Fury on the train, you know, they, they eventually run into, run into each other on this train ride. And this is a much more quiet moment in the episode, but it allows us to peer more into Nick Fury, his upbringing, who he is as a person. And I love those moments. We get, we got something similar in yes. Captain America, the winter soldier, when he was talking about his father and the lunch bag and riding the elevator every day, being that elevator operator, and then eventually carrying the gun. That was a small moment to provide window provide a window into the inside of who he is as a person and how he was raised. And now we go even deeper here. He talks about his mother and riding on trains, very similar to the one that they're on now and having to ride into the, into the Negro colored car because it was segregated Mm -hmm. and not having access to good food and good water. So they had to sneak fried chicken onto the plane and they would play these games with each other. Like, tell me something that you don't know. And he he uses that story to make a point to Talos to to try to get information about the scrolls and and try to find out more about their place on Earth and their existence and why they're here and just everything that's happened. And we find out that there's one million scrolls on Earth. One million scrolls. (laughs) That's a lot of motherfucking scrolls just chilling on Earth. And they get into it. That big that that pisses Fury <laughs> off. He's like, wait a second, what? You didn't tell me this? How do you think you're gonna just sit here chilling on Earth for, for with one million of you? We can't even tolerate each other. How do you expect us to tolerate you all? They just go back and forth and have this really, really good, I think just good exchange of dialogue. Talos is making really good points. Like, mm-hmm. you were the host, you invited us. And Fury is like, you know, well, the host can set the terms. And he was like, Well, the host left. So what what the fuck? Like, what are we supposed to Bars. do while you're gone? Just bar <laughs> after bar. I just want to get your thoughts on just that whole that whole tension and that 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 crescendo of that conversation because it started yeah. off in a good place with Fury trying to make a point, providing insight into who he is and and why he is the way that he is, but then it ultimately leaving us in a situation where we're we're let to think like you know this this is kind of a really fucked up situation on both ends. Like they both are making very valid points at that at that particular moment. Yeah, it's between this scene and the conversation with Rhodey. That's like my favorite of the episode by far. But the I oh the setup is so good. It's so good. The sitting on the train and him telling the story and talking about the South. And him, this is the it, this is a good example. It's a good. Uh, it just feels like the right time to say it. it's a good example of why like when culture bending can be uh, beneficial to a character because now it's more. It's Nick Fury telling us about his his how he had to be in the South why he doesn't trust people as much, how he had to ride in the color car and take food in a shoebox. That's crazy that they had to sneak in food in a shoebox. But now it tells us a different landscape of who his character is and why he can't trust people because of his blackness, right? Because of the way he had to be treated. And now uh, I'm sure he feels some type of way about scrolls being on this earth and being able to be incognito <laughs> And not have to go through the things that he had. Like, he's like, I understand 
why I am the way I am. But now y'all get to be whoever the heck y'all want to be. Y'all get to uh, y- y'all get to kind of be more free a little bit, right? He's like, Talos, you are portraying a white man right now. I don't think you understand the threat <laughs> that this is or this possesses because you never you d- you're just not thinking the same way I'm thinking, especially with one million scrolls being on the earth is crazy. It's not just one million because technically in the grand scheme of seven billion people being on our earth, one million doesn't sound like a lot, but it does because the scrolls have the inside to everything. Partially because of Nick Fury, a million a million is crazy. This is not just people working at the bank. You know what I'm saying? These are probably world leaders. This is probably yeah, we military see prime officers. Yeah, they've infiltrated at all levels. This is not a normal million. You know, I'm in Kansas City right now. There's probably two million people overall. Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. Two million people. You're like, dang, that's not a lot. It is if you take all these people and insert them in the most powerful positions in the world. It absolutely is. So, like, it, it it's crazy because they both are making points. And I, I, I really love when people can make metaphorical setups to the grand scheme of what the story is going to be. Because that story was really good that he told me into asking, tell me something I don't know. And it 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 it. it I, I, yeah, I just see both sides. I see why Talos is mad. I see why Nick Fury is mad. And when you can see both sides, that makes for a good story. It makes for a good scene. And the acting, what Samuel Jackson was doing there was great. It was great. It was really good. This is what I was here for. I was here for Samuel Jackson and his acting to do what he needed to do. And he did it in that moment. And it is. it was just very well done. It was very well acted. Very well written. That's a good script to me. That's a good screenplay to me, the way that they were talking about that. And so I, I was I was just really I was really happy to see that scene and the way it turned out because it was like, oh, yeah, now we're here. This is this is what I was looking for. Yeah, we're digging in. We're we're deep into this because this is a very personal issue and confrontation for everybody involved. Talos has lost a lot. You know, he he, he lost the, the love of his life. Nick Fury is coming off of the heels of losing Maria Hill. Those trust issues, as you mentioned, have been boiling underneath the surface for his entire life. You know, ever since he yeah. was a young boy with his mother and he's living in a society that's segregated, he can't have access to certain things that carries over into his professional life. And we find out even later that, that, that that's infiltrated all aspects of him. Relationships that he thought were meaningful to him were no longer meaningful because people were going behind his back and being undercover secret Hydra agents, you know, even to that yeah. extent. And mm-hmm. you you add that on top of the fact that they're in Moscow, which Nick Fury is a, what, six foot three bald headed black man walking around. He <laughs> stands out like a fucking sore thumb and they and they yeah. call attention to that. I love that, that mm-hmm. he is incognito and undercover. But anytime somebody's like, yeah, do you know a black American? It's like, um, I think you'd be able to find him if you looked hard enough. Like, it's not going to be difficult to spot in Moscow, or Russia. Like, they're calling attention to all those things. And I think it's just really expertly done. And then on Talos' side, again, frustrated and angry because his right hand man, Fury, the guy that he's supposed to have the closest relationship in terms of a human being, mm-hmm. just hasn't been there for him, has not been by his side fighting this war, has been vacant and absent throughout these past three to four years. And he's like, dude, you told us that you were going to find us a home and it's been a really long time and when i tried to have constant communication with you you vanished we couldn't reach out to you you left you were supposed to be our protector the person to look out for us and you just haven't been here and so there's just very valid points being made on all sides of the conversation but speaking of valid we should talk a little bit more about gravic as we noted within the beginning of the episode we find out really why he became the way that he became and why he's now the leader of this scroll rebellion in order to incite this war between russia and the United States eventually to take over Earth. But we get another pivotal scene where we see the Scroll Council, which is essentially this council that's that's been established to, to provide leadership to the one million scrolls living on Earth. And mm-hmm. that's where we explicitly find out that, like, yeah, these scrolls have very important positions. Like one of them is the secretary of NATO. One of them is the prime minister of the UK. One of them played by Christopher McNaught. He's a he's a Fox News broadcaster like they're out here. They're working, you know, and so they have a very, very front facing presence on earth and so they come and they have this council meeting and basically graphic is is telling him what he's going to do he's like you know you guys are going to submit to me we're going to incite this war this is going to be our home planet and if you don't side with me then it's probably going to be an issue for you and the only one that you know ultimately 
provide some sort of resistance to Gravik is uh, Shirley Cigar. Um, and she she has a very valid point in, in a line mm-hmm. that I thought was really profound. She says, we didn't become homeless refugees because we weren't willing to wage war. We became homeless refugees because we were too willing. And I mm-hmm. think that this is a really cool thing that underscores both the comics history of the scrolls, but then yeah. also like how they've been translated into live action that they're no longer these warmongering villains, but some of them still are. And we're seeing mm-hmm. graphic is like leading this contingent of those that still are, but many of them are just normal and just want a home. And so they're trying to fight these two battles at the same time. And so you see that push and pull and the fact that there's like a, a scroll civil war, forget the Cree. They're not really yeah. involved here. Like they're fighting amongst amongst each other. What did you think about just the development of seeing that, seeing how, you know, people are falling on all different sides of this conflict and graphic is like now the person that's going to take, in, you know, take charge and become like the leader of the new scroll council. Yeah. I think it makes it interesting because there is a whole landscape that tells us that, you know, the, the Cree technically ended up pushing them out of their home at some point. And it, it, it would be accurate to, to how some people still, I think feel some type of way and are expanding that energy in other places. Again, i.e. Nick Fury, (laughs) his inability to find them a new home is like, well, we couldn't win that war, but I bet you we can win this one. You know, it almost feels like people are, 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 are uh, uh, pointing fingers toward at the wrong people sometimes. Right. But I, I, it, I do like that this concept of a different civil war within the scrolls, because now it's a new, it's a whole new thing. We have set up, Talos uh, and his daughter, <laughs> you know what I mean, to be on one side. In fact, his daughter is the one that's like, what's going on here? I don't really know what you have going on. And I love that, though. I love how not only do not only are we made to to, I think, be afraid or to be confused about who's on what side and what scrolls are on what side. The scrolls within themselves are already also on that uh, on, on that kind of, you know, that type of time. Because if you telling me scrolls don't even know who's a scroll, that that's when it gets scary. <laughs> that's when you're like, OK, now we're we're doing something completely different. This scrollception. Y'all don't know who y'all don't even know your brother. You know what I'm saying? You don't even know your own kind. That's when it gets scary. And so I, I really like, uh, uh, I guess, kind of this, 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 like you said, the civil war happening because it creates an interesting conflict. It's more than one conflict. It's more than. Nick Fury and Rhodey and everybody else trying to save the world from scrolls. Now it's scrolls who just want homes, not they don't want the other scrolls to destroy this home that they have, you know, kind of built. And so, yeah, it's it, it, I think it makes for good storytelling and it makes for uh, eventually, again, what could be a, a, a cool war to watch. Unfortunately, I know it sounds terrible, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, it, it's going to be fun, a fun thing to see go down, to see. Who's who's the main players? We see most of the main players, right? But to see how it goes down and to see who turns to what side, I think I think it'll be very interesting. Yeah, no doubt. I think uh, in this particular scene, Kingsley Benadire was just doing just really, really great acting work. I'm like, yeah, you're a bad guy. You're a villain yeah. for sure. I'm somewhat <laughs> sympathetic to you just because of what we found out earlier in the episode. But ultimately, you are going down a very, very dark path. And we see that it's not only just taking over Earth as the planet to make it their home world. He also has even more ulterior motives, which we'll we'll get to in a second. But it's the it's the super powered scroll. He's trying Mm -hmm. to he's trying to bring all these different DNAs and and, and information together to create somewhat of a serum almost, because I think what's notable is that in the comics in the Secret Invasion comics, the 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 quick tell um, between uh, an actual hero or whether or not they were a scroll is the fact that You couldn't replicate powers. You could replicate the appearance, but you couldn't replicate powers. And so to combat Mm -hmm. that, many of the scrolls had access to the super soldier serum in order to get powers. That's not really an element here. And so we find out that he's trying to like essentially create super scrolls and and, and give them powers. But I just love the acting that he does here. I just love the conflict between all these different leaders of the scroll and just the different ideologies coming to the forefront. And, you know, surely being the one that's like, I'm not going down this path with you because I don't agree. This is how we kind of ended up in the, in the position that we're in in the first place. We have to do this in a more peaceful means. And he's like, now fuck that. Like we had the one guy who was looking out for us, tell us, some false bullshit and it's time like i'm i'm of age i'm ready to make this happen i'm gonna lead this into the future and make sure that i can preserve our society and our species and so it's just many different ways to look at it and and ultimately paints a a pretty horrific picture Mm -hmm. in terms of like what he's willing to do in order to achieve his goal i do want to quickly talk about 
sort of like not the next scene, but one, one of the key scenes in this in the series. And it, it, it and it's connected to just the tone of what we're experiencing so far, because when we see Olivia Coleman come back into this episode, Fallsworth, she has a scroll in her possession and she essentially commits torture on the scroll. And <laughs> Olivia Coleman is having too much fucking fun in that We're scene. So she is fun. chewing it up. But in addition to that, we also see Gravik infiltrate that facility mm -hmm. in order to rescue him. And this show immediately gets pretty bloody, pretty graphic, real fast. There's gunshots, there's knives, there's yeah. bullets, and just all sorts of stuff happening. And I was watching it like, oh, well, wait a second. I didn't expect it to get to this level of violence, this graphic mm -hmm. violence. Like, it's not the most hard R-rated R stuff that we've ever seen, but... I think it's certainly different than what we're accustomed to with the MCU. What do you think about just the, the usage of violence here? Also knowing that 2000 people died, there is a high body count and how that just ties into what this show is trying to set out to do anyway. It, it's more of a, a spy craft espionage story to begin with, which is much more grounded, much more closely related to, to the political unrest that we're kind of experiencing within this story. How do you feel that they're just, you know, sort of bringing all that to life and how they're communicating that through the different action beats and, and action moments throughout this episode, man, these popular i think spy and espionage movies are not rated pg you know what i'm saying they out here being rated r people die <laughs> in these espionage movies and i think marvel recognizes that in their in, in and i think they are trying to again slowly but surely push that envelope because we got some stories to tell that are kind of have to look like this if not worse than this quote i mean deadpool and wolverines and it's like we we have to it's time to push that envelope. So, uh, Dare Double Born again is coming. They they need some they need some transition bridge shows to get us there. And I think <laughs> Secret Invasion uh, in this episode in particular is doing some some good work to kind of get us there. When I seen Olivia Coleman, Sonya, cut old boy's finger off, I said, wait a second. So there there there's the concept of cutting a finger off. I'm like, oh, she's gonna cut her finger off, but they showed us. <laughs> they showed us. <laughs> her cutting the finger off and then it turned green i was like is this is this the and show we're doing you see the bone too inside the you finger see the bone i was like oh this is crazy and then she injects him with to make his blood boil like what mcu is this the same <laughs> i was like is this the same stuff we've been watching because we we had never got to like this level this is crazy torturing somebody um, by the ways in which they did. And then, like you said, when Gravik and his boy, they pull up and they are shooting. I mean, I'm looking at the bullet, the bullet hitting them in the chest. And usually usually Marvel is good at like Winter Soldier, one of the greatest MCU movies ever. You don't see like blood splatter. You know what I'm saying? Like the hand to hand combat is amazing. You could clearly see niggas are getting fucked up. But this is like we are seeing bullet holes and blood and people cutting people's fingers off. And it's I just I I didn't know. I didn't know. It's what I wanted. And that's what I was hoping we would do. But I have my suspicions. And now I'm like, OK, if we're doing this in episode two, I need to see three, four, five, six. <laughs> do some more of this because this is this is good work. I think they're doing good work and and I'm glad to see Marvel. I think it's pushing that envelope again because they have to. And now is now was the time in which they they I, I think they have to make that transition. And it, it looks like they're 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 they are taking matters into their own hands by doing it. But I love it and I hope they continue to do it, man. Like I said, this is a spy espionage project and you kind of have to have some of these elements present. They could have they could have shot away and they could have done these things but less blood not showed us the finger get cut off but they're doing it and i love that they're they're taking the swing here it was a pleasant surprise i was laying down watching the episode and that shit like got me to like sit up i was like wait a second wait 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 what like what are we doing right now as you said you can see the bullet holes as 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 gravic is shooting and it was the knife talk for me like when he took the knife and like oh slit dude and his and his th i was like oh well wait a second now like we're getting mm -hmm. super graphic now and i think that's the the benefit also of streaming that you can you can walk that line like there's there's not really 
the 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 rating system on streaming i don't want to say it's not as sophisticated as as it is in movies but i don't feel like it's as stringent like you can kind of mm-hmm. play in that sandbox a little bit more and do more things and get away with a little bit more and i just love that they are walking that line like they're showing the blood they're showing the graphic nature of what that looks like it doesn't again have to be over the top like i'm not looking for fucking Django and chain quentin tarantino here but i do want to see some realism to it right like i yeah. do want to see people actually die and see like what the what the physical representation of that looks like and it's not pretty it's it's mm-hmm. pretty gruesome like you see those bullet holes and you see those those cuts and all that stuff and so it was really really cool to see and then olivia coleman and sonia i mean she's just she's sadistic you know she's willing to Crazy. just do whatever it takes and she's smiling the entire time while torturing this dude having all sorts of fun and it's a small moment i don't know if everybody picked up on it but like it's the fact that when she was in the in the freezer with them to begin with she sent her men out to basically get fucking rocked by graphic, knowing that that would just buy her time to do what she had to do more. Like she knew he was on the way. She Mm -hmm. knew he was going to fuck them up. She just needed those extra few minutes to get what she needed out of that scroll. And so to even that point, it's like, yo, this is, this is a very, a very deranged character. Like she's willing to do so many things. And I think we've only scratched the surface of what she's truly capable of. And so I just love all that stuff. So to move on here, I do want to talk about another pivotal scene, which it's probably one of my favorite scenes, at least in the past few years of the MCU. And it's this conversation. It's literally just a conversation. It's nothing happening. It's in a closed off restaurant between Rhodey and Nick Fury. Now, Don Cheadle, we also cannot forget to mention incredible actor, Academy Award nominated actor has been doing this for such a long time, has been around for, for ages now. And I think sometimes we take him for granted just because he's been playing second fiddle to Tony Stark for such a long time. But he's now finally starting to take place center stage with his own stories. He was in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Mm -hmm. He's back here in Secret Invasion now. And then we also know he will be in Armor Wars, which is now a movie instead of a TV series. But they have this conversation between each other. And there were just so many good lines that that were said by these two they're basically going back and forth about their their different ideologies and stances on this whole thing and Rhodey, he's in a very interesting position because he's continuing to sort of serve the government he's acting as a liaison to the president he's that right hand man to the current president who has all the insight and the intel into the superhero community, essentially. And we've mm-hmm. seen Rhodey play that role before, so he's very consistent. Nick Fury, obviously, being sort of on the outskirts, he's a wanted man now. People are looking at him as being the one responsible for the attack in Moscow and all those 2,000 people dying. So now they're on very two opposite sides of the fence when they previously worked together, and then they just have this conversation where everything just kind of breaks down between the two. Rhodey shows up there essentially to give him a military discharge, fire him because of the incident in Moscow. Nick Fury is like, yo, what the fuck? We're tr- we should be working together. Like, we, we, we have the power to actually effectively change this and do something about it. What did you think about just the conversation, all the stuff that they said, just the different stances that they're taking and how they're approaching this, this, this incoming conflict? I, I really like the scene before that because it does tie in where he is defending Nick Fury uh, against against Russia and the prime minister and all these people, because it, it almost, I think, ties back into something my mom always told me. Right. Where it's like stick up for him in, in front of everybody in else public, <laughs> yep. mm-hmm. in public and, and then, then deal with it at home. Tell him the real because because when that was happening, I was like, oh, shoot, he got Nick Fury back. And then. The next scene, <laughs> my boy is roasting Nick Fury. He's going in on him. I was like, dang, this is so accurate. But this is exactly how it's supposed to be done. Because now in public, everybody knows that he was defending him. But behind closed doors, they can have the real conversation that they need to have. And I love, we we very, very rarely in the MCU get a chance for two black men to sit down and just have a conversation with their blackness in mind, though, too. It's not like they were like, we're not going to talk about this at all. Nick Fury is like, no, bro, people that look like us, we don't always get to have the privilege to do this. And Don Cheadle was like, you're right. Now that I'm here, I'm going to use it to do what I thought I should have been doing while I didn't have it, while I didn't have this title, while I didn't have this job. And and now I'm going to sustain it so we can keep it, so we can continue to do the work <laughs> that we need to do. And, 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 and Nick Fury is like, like you said, he's like, we could work together and dodge dodge. He's just not having it, man. I really love this conversation. It is tremendous. I'd never seen this coming from a million, a thousand miles away that we would get this scene, but I love it so much, man. It's like, it's, it's, it's the kind of content like this that I, 
I feel like I was always looking for <laughs> the MCU for them to talk about. Remember with like uh uh this is what I wanted them to talk about in um Falcon and Winter Soldier that they would never they would like they would touch it but they wouldn't talk about it. And then here they're like really talking about it and I I love it cuz there is a bigger threat outside. And Don Chino does have his hands tied as the 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 what is he the the um I keep want to say secretary of state but that's not it. The uh I don't know what he is exactly, but he 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 works definitely with like Department of Defense specifically. Department of Defense, you know, yeah, the so, head, yeah. whatever. He 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 does have his hands tied, and he does have a view to where you can see like Nick Fury is a he's a problem on the front line, right? He's making America look bad. What made the beginning of the episode so important is oh boy is like America. I'm American. I'm American. I'm American. I'm American. He's saying that so America and Russia are at war you know as much as they can he's like look nick you're part of this problem you are the face of this problem right now like you said he's a black man walking around in moscow everybody's like where is nick fury of course miss scroll prime minister is gonna be like nick fury <laughs> nick fury it's him but don chino does have again he has his hands tied because he has to say okay i understand at least a little bit what you're saying nick fury but i can't do it I have to one, I have to fire you. Two, I can't I, I I can't possibly compromise my position to help you in this moment because I might not be able to help more people if I do. And that is the realest shit <laughs> that I've ever heard. That is like that is almost the 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 essence of when you I don't know, let's say you got a really good job and, and somebody's like, hey bro, can you give me a job with you? And you're like, I wish I could, but I can't. <laughs> I really want to. But in this moment, I simply can't do it because my hands are tied. And I see it from Nick Fury's side, too, though. We've worked together all these years. We could save the world to a degree. <laughs> you are kind of a public enemy. Like, I can't. And, yeah, it's just I, I love the complicate how complicated the conversation is. I love that it's 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 not all peaches and cream. It's not all sugar and happy two black men getting together it's like no this is what this is the real and this is how it has to go down and we're going to talk about it we're not only going to talk about it by the way of military presence and and what this looks like and how we can save more people and how it looks like that you might have gotten two thousand people killed and maria hill and all these people it's more than that it's also the the he said hey brother he literally used brother hey brother we can do this this is the we, he, he's had conversations with Sonya. You're not who you think you are right now. Had conversations with Maria Hill. You're not who you think you are right now. It took Don Cheadle to also be like, bro, you're, I don't know how you're stepping right now, but it's not how you usually step. This is not Nick Fury. I cannot help you right now. I'm sorry. I can't be on your side. This is like the, this is like the, the third nail in the coffin to me. It was like Nick Fury, bro. I'm sorry, but you are not the guy at this point in this moment in time. And I absolutely love the conversation that they were having. 10 out of 10. He needed it. He, he needed it to come from somebody who, who he thought would be on his side and, and wrongly assumed that that would be the case because it was not, you know, Rhodey said it literally, he said, we protect the planet by protecting our seat at the table. That's how we make sure that Bar. this can continue. And that's, that's an incredible point to make because he's right. He is a thousand percent right. And again, it's consistent with this character. Rhodey has always been, the team player, he's always worked alongside the government and been on the inside helping out in any way that he can. And some people might look at that as like, oh, damn, man, you're kind of you're kind of being a little bit of a traitor here. If mm -hmm. you're working with the government, going to get your your comrades in battle, a little <laughs> little coonish, you're working for the white man. Like, mm -hmm. all right, fair enough. You know, we saw what you were doing after Civil War, working on behalf of the government and, you know, threatening to lock up the Avengers if you found them. But. At the same time, Rhodey is also thinking about the long game as well. And I think in this particular instance, removing it, you know, from the previous things that have happened with the Avengers, this one, I think he absolutely is valid in what he's saying here. That doesn't make Nick Fury necessarily wrong to mm -hmm. in, in totality, but that doesn't make Rhodey wrong either. And all the stuff that he says is absolutely true. Like, yo, this is a bad look right now. This absolutely looks terrible on you. And by the way... You kind of did this, my guy. You are responsible in part for this because another bomb that's dropped in this conversation is that Rhodey knew about the scrolls for like 15 years. Yeah. He's known about them this entire time. So this is not new information to him. And Nick Fury is surprised to find out about that. He's like, wait, you knew and you didn't say anything? Rhodey's like, yeah, you know, we were brought into a presentation. I was privy to this information. 
I kept it quiet because ultimately they have to keep it quiet. And that also lends to another point of the conversation where, you know, Rhodey's like, well, maybe we can call our friends. Cause of course I know a lot of people watching this are like, well, where are the Avengers? Why don't they just show up and combat the threat? <laughs> and Nick Fury's like, well, no, if we do that, if we call them, not only do we compromise them and allow them to possibly be re replicated by bad scrolls, but also it reveals that scrolls are present to begin with. It reveals mm -hmm. that they're actually living on earth. And that's a very valid thing to want to protect and keep secret. And so all these things are being said. So much information is being conveyed. There was the line about wrestling the power away from the mediocre Alexander Pierce's of the world, which Alexander Pierce, that's a direct tie-in from Captain America, the Winter Soldier, played by Robert Redford, which I thought was an incredible line to say because Nick Fury also had a super close relationship with Alexander Pierce. That was somebody mm. that he trusted in Hydra. Yeah. And then he mm. realized, like, wait a second, not only are you not on my side, not only are you working on behalf of Hydra, this terrorist organization, you also fucking suck. So I need to be the one in power. <laughs> and then the blackness comes into it, as you said. And yeah. now they're talking about having that seat at the table, preserving that power, making sure that they maintain it. Nick Fury is basically working on outside the system now. Rhodey is working inside, trying to keep it. So we're at a standstill. We're at an impasse at this point. And that just leads to that leads to Rhodey discharging him and firing him essentially from this mission. It was incredible. It was a great scene. This this type of stuff is like it's it's walking that balance in a very, very expert way, because exactly. I don't think it's pounding you over the head with it. It's just mm -hmm. it's just making everything real. It's 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 fully utilizing the characters that you have at play and just putting the color and filling it all in. Because we as black men, we can sit here and assume these things in our head and, and have those conversations. But for them to directly address it and to do so in the way that they did, I just thought was it was it was tremendous. It was amazing and just excellent work. On the on the parts of Don Cheadle and Samuel Jackson here, it was it was really it was really kind of the best work I've seen out of out of two actors in the MCU in, in a minute now. So yeah. it was great to see. Um, I do want to talk about Gravik's other plan with this with this super super scroll sort of backdrop and what he's trying to do here. There was mm -hmm. there was a really pivotal scene where we see Gaia, who's kind of like working as a double agent. We we don't really know how to feel about her at this point. She's kind of playing yeah. both sides. You know, she still obviously is very close with her father, Talos, but she's also kind of working alongside Gravik right now. So we don't really know how to feel about her, but there was a really key scene here where she finds some informa uh, information about scrolls who've been co collecting different different alien parts from all across the universe to create these superpowered scrolls we see on the computer screen there's information about Groot there's information about a frost beast from Jotunheim there's there's a, a name check of Cull Obsidian who we know is a part of Thanos's Black Order mm -hmm. there's also a name check of the extremist superpowered weapon that was introduced in Iron Man 3 mm -hmm. which I think a lot of these things are kind of just like loose threads that haven't been wrapped up like Cull Obsidian's arm in Avengers Infinity War got chopped off and it's just like in the Ant arc Antarctic somewhere. Well, maybe somebody <laughs> wouldn't pick that up and maybe they can use it for something, right? Yeah. And I think that that's just like a cool tie in and ultimate in, in, in sort of like information that that can be used to create what I presume would be like super scrolls and, and the DNA of all these different mm -hmm. alien parts. What did you think about that? Do you think it's ultimately going to result in that? And, and, and will we likely see super scrolls? And then the other thing I just want to like quickly tack on to that question. Do you think that this could potentially tie into what we might see with the Marvel's coming out later this year because i think mm. that there have been a lot of references to how closely these two projects are related so i'm wondering if maybe the threat here carries over into that movie man it's so interesting because they there's a lot of ways i think they can play it but the idea of super scrolls to me if they succeed then we start to get cameos right we start to see those superheroes and in, in, in the idea of the original secret invasion where you're like wait is that person a scroll? Is this person a scroll? And so I think I think there is potential there, maybe, you know, the, the past couple of episodes or the, the last couple of episodes to potentially get some of that stuff if, if the Super Scrolls is successful. Because I do have a feeling it will be to a degree. Um, and I, I think that stuff is cool, though. I think I think seeing studying somebody like Groot makes a ton of sense to me. Right. Like the dude, he grows his his DNA is weird. He literally died <laughs> and became like a new being right we know like the original group is not the same as this group but it still kind of is right it's still they still have the same soul or whatever the same essence it's which is very interesting because i can see how using that with some weird scroll dna could create something could could append uh uh something to make uh super scrolls at some point in time i i, I do see it and so i love that 
they're injecting some of that science from the beings we've already gotten in the MCU to bring that over uh, into something like this. But we'll have to see, man. Uh, but I, again, part of me wants to see it a little bit, right? If if a Super Scroll comes out here and I'm like, okay, but what hero powers are they using? And and who is it? Who I I, I, have, I have a feeling they they have to pick somebody that we have we've been with for a long time <laughs> to say, yep, they've been a scroll this entire time. Surprise. And so I, I can't wait to see how that goes down and, and, and how that happens, man. But I, I think they're good decisions being made because I think if if the science is done right and all these experiments are done right and you see they've been they're trying to figure out who the scientists are right of what, and what's going down and I think I think if all that makes sense it'll make for some good uh some good storytelling in the long run. Yeah, this is where the the comic book nature of this story comes into play which I got to be real and honest about it. I was just so locked into all these small character moments and just like watching conversations like nothing mm -hmm. else is happening. And then we start to get into the experimentation and we're talking about all these references. And you pointed MCU. that out earlier, you know, all these just like references to other characters and the MCU at large. And it's like, oh, all right, I'm starting to kind of lose it here. I'm starting to become a little bit less interested in it. So a part of me, which is like, damn, could this just be like a regular spy show? Like, it's so mm -hmm. good so far. Exactly. And then you get like that, that comic book time. But it is necessary. I just think it, it does depend on how they play it, because now this introduces the more heightened element of it. You know, I think the creators of the show, they're, they're going after more grounded storytelling. They're, they're going after those those, you know, really popular political thrillers of the 70s, like The Conversation or The French Connection or Parallax View, like all that stuff is present. But when you get into the more heightened nature of the story and you're, you're putting the Marvel within within the Marvel comics of it all. It, it just depends on the execution because this could go either really well or possibly not so well. Cause what I don't want to happen, I just don't want them to fall in the formula and the trap of introducing all these really salient, profound ideas, these really, these really big ideas at play to then somewhat undo that because we're going to have a big battle between exactly. scrolls and whoever else at the end of this, because mm -hmm. we have these superpower beings. Maybe we can try to combat some of that, 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 that possible, that possible, um, you know, I guess sort of, uh, watered down nature of the story with with making this a, a bigger overarching story across a couple of projects i just don't want to see that happen in episode six and so i'm a little a little cautious about it but beyond that i will say it does add again a little bit more layers and depth and, dim and dimension to graphic as a character because the stuff that i like about him so much is just like the political unrest that he's creating he's trying to de de destabilize the government the established order by by starting this war by committing terrorist acts by getting people very scared and par paranoid about their current place in society without ever actually revealing himself we, like humans still don't even know about scrolls like they don't even know that that that's the, the central problem shit's just happening and then you add on this fact that oh okay he's trying to actually create like super powered beings now he's trying to actually take it to the next level so it can be really good but they just have to play with it carefully i think by the by the end of the story Agreed. um that sort of brings us to the concluding moments of this episode which again sort of another big reveal which can be interpreted in a few different ways we see Nick Fury go back home, which he has a, a great home, by the way. It's a beautiful, a beautiful house. He goes back home and, and we see who we presume to be his wife. And before he actually walks in the house, she is presenting herself as a scroll while she's making dinner. But then when Nick Fury walks into the house, she is presenting as her normal self, you know, as a as a black woman that he's married to. And she also reminds him to put on his wedding ring, which I thought was a nice touch because Nick Fury wouldn't want to wear wedding ring wedding ring out in the field because that would just make him seem weak and vulnerable. You know, people shouldn't know about his family life. And he's only, mm -hmm. I think maybe made one reference, one off the cuff reference to having a wife in the Winter Soldier. But even based on that reference, you wouldn't necessarily assume that he actually has a wife. It might have just been used as like a as a cloaking device to 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 you know subvert expectations and, and confuse people, right? Exactly. So we see her here. And, and my question is this one. Does Nick Fury even know that he's married to a scroll? Like, I don't even know if that was clearly communicated. Like, at first, when I looked at it, I was like, oh shit, like he's married to a scroll. That makes a lot of sense. But then I started thinking, like, well, wait, why would she change her appearance when he walks in the house if mm -hmm. he already knows that she's a scroll? Yeah. Is it to keep up the incognito nature of her appearance? Is it to still perform as a human? Is it to make him feel more comfortable? I don't really know if that's totally clear. How did you read that particular sequence? And just what do you think about the fact that whether he knows it or not, he is indeed married to a scroll? I I have a feeling that he knows his wife's secret. Um I really do. Uh and it it 
it does kind of have to do, I think, early in the episode where she is presenting um, um, graphic to him and and things like that. Because we we do think this is Vara, the same scroll. I think the so. Beginning, who mm-hmm. is next to next to graphic and be like, oh yeah, his mom and dad, blah blah blah. We do think that is her. So I have a feeling that he knows, and I think that's why he. I think that's another layer of why his relationship with the scrolls is so tight, you know, quote unquote. Uh, but I don't know, because I, I thought the same thing for a second. I was like, does he know? But part of me is like, maybe he just maybe she just wants to be presented as a black woman <laughs> when she sees him um, in, in that in that kind of, I guess, comfortability space. You know, um, maybe maybe she hasn't made been comfortable enough from 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 Nick herself to want to be. In, in her her natural scroll form all the time either but i think i think he knows um and i think it's funny that it's edited that way <laughs> that we see like well, that'd be crazy if he didn't know like i just can't imagine a world where he doesn't know that his wife is a scroll and i think that's why in, in my mind i think uh uh it's it's fine but i think it works either way to be honest part of me likes the paranoia that he he might not know part of me likes that idea that like Oh shoot! Does Nick does Nick really not know? Because it that that creates something completely different. That means Nick is again. We think by him not wearing a wedding ring, he's he's not being uh, uh, exposed to outside forces about knowing about his family, knowing about his wife. We go from that to like you are the most exposed person <laughs> in this entire show now. If your wife is a scroll, so I I really like the idea that it, it could work both ways, but. I think um I think I think it it creates an interesting dynamic though between him and Gravik now because uh, uh I think it just makes the comp- the relationship more complicated knowing that his wife is a scroll it makes him I think it, of course he wants to you know e- e- expand Gravik in that way and 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 of course save the world and what by the ways in which he needs to but knowing that he portrayed one of his wife's people or not betrayed, but one of his wife's people is against him, I think changes and makes it all that much more emotional. So we'll have to see, man. I really don't know, but I have a feeling he knows exactly that his wife is a scroll. And I think, um, yeah. And I think she'll play a, a, a interesting part in the rest of the story, knowing that information. It's going to, it's going to be crazy. We'll have to see. Yeah. I love how they just communicated that whole sequence across, across those final few moments, because I think they want us to ask that question. Like, does he know, does he not know if Nick does indeed know that his wife is a scroll and she's been a scroll this entire time, it does present another, another huge conundrum for him because part of preserving the secret that he even is married. Part of the reason why he walks out of the house without a wedding ring is because if anybody found out that he was married to a scroll, Mm. it'd be fucking hell for him because he, they, they would look at him like, Oh, well, wait a second. You've been protecting this alien species for 30 years and you haven't said anything. And now you're directly tied into them because your wife is a scroll. So Mm -hmm. clearly you're siding with them. And now it looks like you also want to possibly wipe out the human race to make them a new home on planet earth. It becomes uber uber complicated for him and then if he doesn't know that also is just equally as 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 crazy to think about because not only is his wife priscilla been keeping a secret from him but in addition to that she was directly tied into graphic as, as a young boy and and is now seeing this all come to fruition you know all these years later and so it would probably force her to reveal herself as a scroll to nick you know just mm-hmm. due to the nature of what's happening right now which will just change his entire worldview and so i do think that he knows if i had to pick a side i agree i do yeah. think that he knows and i think that just the reason for the switch it could be a couple of things one it could just be her presenting herself that way to make him feel more comfortable like exactly. it just it's a natural thing for him as a human being to want to go home to a wife that looks like a black woman like that mm-hmm. that that makes a ton of sense which is also really crazy to think about because her as a scroll presenting as a black woman this kind of gets crazy and deep when you think no, about it I'm but she has to put her blackness aside mm-hmm. um in order to feel comfortable because we know scrolls they feel most comfortable in their natural state. They don't feel comfortable right. disguising as humans, but the fact that she has to like put on blackness to make her husband feel comfortable and acquiesce to him, like it just, it starts to get kind of crazy. crazy when you think about it that way. <laughs> um, but then in addition to that, I think it's that other point, the fact that scrolls do feel more comfortable in their natural state. And so like when he's not at home, 
she's basically like, oh, I'm taking my drawers off. Like I'm walking around naked. That's that's yeah. that's the equivalent of it. I'm home. I'm comfortable. I ain't got to worry about nobody. I'm safe. And so she can just be free and open and relax. Whereas like when he comes home, it's like, OK, I got to I got to perform a little bit and I got to do this. But I'm going to do that because that's my husband and I love him. You know, so I just I just love how we can start to think and, and ask all those questions um, before we close out here. Got to ask, because this is the first time we're really talking about it. Who else is a scroll? Is Nick Fury a scroll? Is Rhodey a scroll? Is the current president a scroll? Is Maria Hill secretly a scroll? We got to ask this about literally every fucking character because that's the nature of this show. But just watching this whole thing unfold, I'm like, well, who is it? I feel like we are setting up for some big reveal at the end of it that at least one big character that we have never known to be a scroll will reveal themselves by the end of it. I think all the other reveals of like who's secretly a scroll they're probably going to keep doing it with minor characters that haven't really had much of a relationship with us to begin with political Mm -hmm. figures, just, you know, sort of nameless people. But in terms of like the heroes, the Avengers, people that have been here, I feel like there has to be a big one. I don't know if it's going to be Nick. I don't know if it's going to be Rhodey or maybe somebody else, but what would you sort of say to just that whole, that whole state of that conversation right now and who possibly might be a scroll in all of this? Man, it's so hard to tell. And that's what I like about it, that I don't know who they're going to pick, but I know everyone's going to be like, what the hell? They've been a scroll this whole time. Like part of me in my mind, I was thinking about it because we know super scrolls don't exist yet. A lot of them in my mind couldn't have powers. Right. So in my mind, the a scroll could be like Clint Barton. Yeah. Could yeah, be a scroll. Sense. I mm-hmm. feel like the way S.H.I.E.L.D. works and the way all of that other stuff works. Black Widow. It <laughs> could be could have been a scroll the whole time or, you know, something similar to a uh, Agent Coulson. <laughs> it could have, could be a scroll. Though. Like, it's really hard to tell. And I, I really don't know, man. Uh, and, I, and, and again, I really like that about it. that I don't know which direction they're going to go into. And I'm also, again, thinking about people who could have gotten. Who got their powers induced versus like they just have powers, right? Because. Mm-hmm, yeah. When you think about it like that, it could be goddamn anybody. Everybody, this ain't DC where like they're just gods. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is these are people who like ran into something or fell in something or got injected with something to become heroes. And then that in that in that thought process, a lot of them could be scrolls. And that's what makes it scary. You really don't know who could be out here shapeshifting um and, and end up being a scroll. And so man, I don't know. It's it's really hard to tell. I think the reason I like Clint Barton is because he has a family. And yeah. so, like, his kids would low-key be scrolls, but maybe Linda Cardinelli's character, I'll keep forgetting her name, maybe she's not. You know what I'm saying? Like, maybe, and, and that's, like, similar dynamic between what Nick Fury has going. I don't know. I don't know. It could, it, they, that they, um, turn to scrolls. But, again, I love that. I'll, uh, emulate though because i think that's also important like mm-hmm. uh, super scroll comes along and it ends up being like let's copy again captain america comes to mind and in, 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 you know in the first but like let's copy i don't know god dang <laughs> the incredible hulk that's some scary stuff like mm-hmm. whoa mm-hmm. we cannot have hulks <laughs> running around around here we can't we can't do that so uh, i think it'd be cool regardless yeah, it, it, it opens up a ton of possibilities. That That's a really good point about the fact that they cannot replicate powers. You know, that that's a very, a very important thing to remember unless they have some sort of super soldier serum or they inject themselves with something like they can't replicate powers. And there are there, there, there are not that many heroes in the MCU that have natural powers like they all pretty much got them accidentally. Like you can count Thor, you know, he has natural powers, but everybody else pretty much has, you know, been injected with something or or, or, mm-hmm. or accidentally fell in something. And so I don't know either. Um, if I had to pick, I don't think it's Nick Fury just because like, I feel like they're trying to, they're trying to get us to think about that and ask that question. But I, I just I feel like, so it. Either. yeah, I feel like it'd be too obvious. They did have that moment in episode one when he first got off of the space station and arrived and arrived on earth, like his shadowy, like silhouette very much looked alien-esque. You know, it looked like something out of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I mm-hmm. felt like they were just trying to, like, play with that idea and make us think, like, well, maybe he is a scroll and, in, 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 you know, sort of intentionally get us to ask that question. But I don't think it's him. But if I had to pick somebody, I do think it's Rhodey. Honestly, I do think it's Rhodey just because him knowing about the scrolls and, like, his his reasoning for how he knew kind of yeah. seems a little flaky to me. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, that's it. Like, you just happened to just get called into a presentation and you found the shit out. Like, that feels a little convenient. Liar. Yeah, it's like, all right, now, you know, what, what does that really mean? And just the close ties to Tony Stark, I think that that can inform a lot. His close ties with the government. So if I had to pick somebody, if I just had to like put a, a good pick, 
yeah, put somebody, you know, in that position, I would pick him because he, he he would seem like the most, just the most reasonable right now. But you never know who could just like pop up in the show. I, I know it's not going to be the comics. We're not going to get all the Avengers necessarily back here. Mm-hmm. It's not going to replicate the scale of the amount of characters that were in the original comic book storyline. But I do anticipate that maybe one other big character might pop up, you yeah. know, that we're not necessarily clocking for that could reveal themselves to be a scroll. Maybe it's in the penultimate episode. Maybe it's in the final episode. I, I'd be very curious to see. Um, last question before we wrap up. What are you looking forward to for the rest of the four episodes? We got four episodes left right now, so we're quickly already getting towards the end of this story. Um, mm-hmm. how, how do you feel things are going to shape up over the course of the next few weeks? And also, do you foresee any possible tie-ins with the Marvels? I think that they've teased that. And I believe also Samuel Jackson has said in an interview that Secret Invasion had to happen so that the Marvels could happen. Mm-hmm. And we have seen him in previews of that movie, and he's on the Saber Space Station. Yeah. And so I'm also just like wondering about the time. Like, when does the Marvels actually take place? Is it is it before Secret Invasion? Is it after? We're not entirely sure, but what's your overall just outlook of the next few episodes and then just maybe sort of the lead into, in, in, into possible future projects throughout the MCU? Man, uh, uh, I'm really not sure. I think this is, of course, by by the end of it, what something I would like to see. I, I want to see this story end in a medium where it's not like, oh, we're happy. We saved the world. You know, graphic is dealt with. And then, um, it, which a lot of the best MCU stories really don't end like that, right? Infinity War, Endgame, the blip had to happen. There's give and take to everything. So more than anything, I would love for, of course, them to save the people, right? This is still a superhero kind of story at the end of the day. I still do kind of want to see some justice be done in some form or fashion. But I would also like to see uh, uh, some repercussions come from this. What is What happens to the scrolls, I think, is what I'm looking forward to the most. Do they... Do they somehow fall um, um, into place and are able to just say Earth is our new home? We have to stay here, you know, kind of that type thing. Or is that what the Marvels is about? Is it about helping find the scrolls a new home? Is it, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what it, I don't really don't know 100 percent what it looks like. But we do know um, wasn't it the end of of uh, WandaVision? Where Monica Rambeau was met with a scroll, and yep. they took her up to 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 the ship. That I don't know. I don't know what's happening up there, man. But I know some scroll. <laughs> we know scrolls are involved, so I I I don't know what it looks like. Maybe it is the concept of of the the powers with the Marvels and how cosmic they are, and they can potentially move intergalactically, interdimensionally to help them find a new world. I have no idea. But I, I I do have a feeling that it will all be connected to it has to do something with the scrolls in their home. I just don't know what that looks like. Maybe they did find them a good home, but there's a power at play to where they can't necessarily get there for some reason. I, I It's really hard to tell. And I'm not sure. But that's I, I think that's kind of what I want to see. I want to see kind of some some, of course, some good action come out of this show still because it is still very much a spy espionage kind of joint i want to see the the cool scroll reveals that's what secret invasion is it's like you're a scroll you're a scroll i kind of want to be shocked a couple times i do and I, I i think that's 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 what i want to happen and i think it will i think they will subvert my expectations in that way at least i'm hoping they'll subvert my expectations in that way um and then yeah and then i i, I, just, I do want to see that marvel's tie-in again right now it's kind of hard to see it's like i don't know what's happening like you said samuel jackson clearly said Secret Invasion and, and Marvels are, are connected. And one doesn't happen without the other, but it's so it's so hard. And I think I like that though. I think I like how it's like we had kind of have to get there. We have to. We need a couple more episodes to kind of see how it's shaping up for that to start to make sense. But I, r- regardless, I think uh, I, th- I think it's shaping up well. We'll we'll have to see though. Yeah, the the central main conflict of this, which I don't know if it'll be resolved by the end of it, because it's a big one. Can scrolls coexist with humans and and continue to live on Earth, or will they ultimately find their own place? Exactly. And Nick Fury, in at the top of this episode, you know, he was yelling at Talos like, "We can't even tolerate each other. What makes you think y'all can live here? Like, there's no space for another species on Earth." And I think that that's kind of like the very central idea that Mm -hmm. somewhere is going to have to be found because right now the resolution for Gravik is to say, fuck humans. Y'all betrayed us. Essentially Nick Fury, you're sort of the avatar for, for the betrayal of scrolls. I'm taking y'all planet for, for myself. 
and 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 that just can't that can't be that can't happen so they have to combat that threat but then you know still where do the scrolls go because right now they are living in secrecy and in, in, in what way is that to live for them like clearly they're not happy like even in episode one with gaia when she met that other that other scroll the black guy he was so happy to see like a, a, a food source from their original planet, that blue, mm. that blue thing that he ate in the car. He was so happy because he was like, I haven't had this in so long. And so they clearly are not the most comfortable that they could be. And we're, and we're meant to be sympathetic towards them and their cause. And so I think ultimately the resolution is for them to find a new planet somewhere. Mm. That just seems like too big of a answer to, 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 to address in this show. It just doesn't exactly. feel like we have enough runway left. And so perhaps that is a part of the Marvels, but because like we've only gotten the teaser trailer, they haven't revealed the story yet. Not really sure, but I, I do have some, I have some suspicion that this story will somewhat carry over into that movie and ultimately find a, a, a resolution and a resolve by the time we reach that film come later this November. But uh, many questions that loom. I just want more of that espionage grounded feel that we continue to get. I want more sadistic shit happening. I want more of the violence yeah. and the mature tone that they're doing. <laughs> continue to raise the stakes, continue to keep it personal with Nick. Cause I think that that's really working for them right now. I know mm. it's different than the comics. I know the avid readers of the comics, you know, might not like every choice that they're making here, but they got to do what's best for the current mcu and the story that they're telling and i think that they're doing a pretty good job episode one little clumsy a little wobbly but they they picked it up for me in episode two and so hopefully the momentum can just continue week after week as we progress towards the end of the show but folks those are all of our thoughts on the first two episodes of the marvel studios original series secret invasion if you've checked out the series definitely hit us up and let us know what you think i'm the last person standing between them and what they really want